OWASP is a nonprofit that stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. OWASP is a community of developers, technologists, and evangelists improving the security of software through tools and resources. OWASP has 100 plus active projects and new project applications are submitted weekly. Projects are open source and are built by our community of volunteers, people just like you. Community and networking. There are hundreds of local chapters worldwide and thousands of members. Meetings are free and open to everyone. They include training, talks, and networking opportunities. Education and training. OWASP hosts many events each year. They are a great way to improve your skills, build your professional network, and learn about new trends in the industry. One of the many ways you can get involved is to become a member. The membership benefits include discounts for events and trainings, your own OWASP email address and Google Workspace access, a vote in our OWASP Global Board elections, and recently, OWASP added a brand new member benefit, access to hands-on application security training through the OWASP Secure Flag open platform. Join us and become a member today. Okay. Yes, yeah, okay. we can see a screen. Uh, great. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about GraphQL hacking. So if you don't already know, GraphQL is this new, new in quite a lot of ways, it's definitely being launched in more organizations, way of writing APIs. And it's kind of scary. When you look at it, you look at it and you go, what, how does this work? This is really confusing. Um, especially if you're like me and are very much used to, you know, RESTful APIs, GraphQL looks very confusing. Um, but actually, because it's so new and because a lot of people misunderstand it, it's actually full of security vulnerabilities. Not on purpose, of course, just by accident. Um, but I'm going to show you how to exploit them and make developers very upset today. So in case you don't know who I am, I know I already got an introduction, but every speaker has one of these slides that show, you know, you should listen to me. I promise I know what I'm talking about. So here's my version. Um, this is me. These are two photos of me. Um, if you know me from the internet, you likely know the purple background, but there's also a real life photo of me as well. Uh, so my name is Katie Paxton Fair. Uh, I got into hacking in June 2019. I was very fortunate to be invited to a Hacker One live event in London. Now, I originally was like, no, I don't want to. I lived in Swindon. That's like two hours on the train, one hour on the train. No, thank you. Central London um, in the middle of the week on like nine o'clock that'll be like hell <laughs> um but i eventually got pressured into it and when i was there i had never done any application security i can't tell you how unqualified i was i had never seen but i'd never heard of owas like just to, don't even ask what owas was back then um i didn't even like i knew what bug bounty hunting was um because i have some friends from university who are bug bounty hunters but me like I did not know anything about security and I wouldn't have called myself a security anything at that point. Like I have a bachelor's in computer science. I worked as a data scientist for about six months before I realized I hit my job. Um, and I was a PhD student and that's how I kind of got into cybersecurity via my PhD, but I still would not have described myself in, as into security. So that was in um, June, 2019. Uh, while I was there, despite never doing any, any of this stuff in the past at all, um, I actually found my first vulnerability and I found my first vulnerability in Uber. Um, I was then very fortunate enough to get invited um, again to go to Vegas during DEF CON. And I totally thought it was a fluke. I was like, there's no way. There is no way I'm going to find another security vulnerability. That's just silly. Um, and then I found two more and I'm a data scientist. Um, I can see a trend for emerging. And that trend to me said, uh, you might be kind of good at this and this might be something you're good at. So what I've really then kind of made it my mission to do is kind of explain things in the way I would have liked them explained to me six months prior. So I made a YouTube channel um, because that is, that is generation. People a little bit older than me go for blog posts. I go for YouTube. Um, and I've been very fortunate. My YouTube channel has really grown in the past year. Like I have 25,000 subscribers, which is just 
so wild to me. I never expected to have that many subscribers at all. And I know some of my subscribers are here. So thank you very much for coming along to my talks. I really do appreciate it. Um, but yeah, so that's where I started. And now like we're looking at whatever time is 2021 now. And I've got, you know, over 30 vulnerabilities. All, all my bugs have been paid out. Like I've been, got bounties for all of my vulnerabilities, no NAs, no dupes, like pretty much like on the ball with, with hacking. Um, and I learned it all myself. Like I was all self-taught. And what I try to do in my videos is pass that knowledge on. Um, so this is what I'm going to do. So uh, let me talk about GraphQL for a bit. So at the ha live hacking event in Vegas, I had literally done a CTF at the hacker one had done for GraphQL a week before, might've been two weeks before. And we're at that event in Vegas. I actually found a GraphQL API and I was like, well, this is convenient. Um, so I researched over the life hacking event, you know, how GraphQL works. And I, we submitted like three vulnerabilities for GraphQL. Um, and they were valid and I got paid them out. And despite not really knowing anything about GraphQL, so this is that kind of late night panicked research combined into a presentation. So I've talked a lot about GraphQL, but I haven't really explained what it is very well. Um, so GraphQL is an API, but not quite as we know it. Usually when developers write an API, they actually write a lot of different endpoints um, to do different things. So we think of like CRUD functionality, create, read, update, delete. And each one of those usually has a separate endpoint to it. And then for each resource, you then have to have a CRUD for each thing. So you look at a forum, you've got users, posts, replies. Um, maybe if you've got like some kind of upvote functionality, maybe you have a file upload and you can quite easily see how an API kind of explodes in terms of size. And that means for a hacker, that means it's exploding in attack surface, which is hard. Like that's hard to manage and hard to deal with. Um, but GraphQL is like a different way of looking at this. So instead of having this one endpoint for every single resource and then every single um, like CRUD operation we can do on it, instead we just create one endpoint. And that's it, that, that's the whole thing. You create one endpoint, your attack surface is then just one endpoint that you need to secure. And then you write kind of queries and then you write um, uh, mutations. So why one endpoint? Well, on the dev side, it makes things quicker. Um, and one thing that's kind of talked about a lot in development circles is how to release code faster. Not because developers have got like, you know, a need for speed, but because development cycles can, we want them to be quite short, so features get released very quickly. So instead of making endpoints for like every single um, resource they have, instead they can write a few queries for these common operations. They then use these queries in lots of different places. So you have a lot of reusable code and developers love reusable code. Now, when we say query, you might be thinking of like SQL queries. Um, and it's kind of similar in the same way that, you know, we have uh, the, the, the fields we want and we have, you know, maybe we have like a check, like a where clause, um, but it's very different in style and that's what scares people. But I hope from this presentation, you will go, actually, that's not that scary. That's quite straightforward. So why talk about GraphQL? Why hack GraphQL? Um, it's a newer technology. Developers are adopting it without being fully aware of the security concerns that implementing this can cause which is not great for these users, but I'll be honest, I'm not a user most of the time. I am a bug bounty hunter. And when I see new technologies, I think full of vulnerabilities um, and it's intimidating. And that's why also a lot of bug hunters don't really like interacting with GraphQL. They think that it's a bit more stressful, a bit more difficult, but actually it's not that much harder than API hacking in general. It just looks different. And you also get to do less work as well because of the way GraphQL works, which is really cool, especially in the recon stage. So it's super intimidating, but you don't have to worry. So I hope now I've convinced you that GraphQL hacking is something you should try for yourself. Um, so you're probably thinking, okay, I'm into this, Katie, let's go. Where do I find GraphQL? And you will find GraphQL in the same place you find regular APIs. Tends to be more common with newer applications, especially when they've got kind of 
potentially more established dev teams. Obviously, it's used at Facebook. They're the people who invented it. But also, we have Yahoo uses it quite a lot. Shopify uses it. HackerOne uses it. And these all have bug bounty programs, by the way, uh, as does Facebook that you can kind of hack on like right now. So GraphQL is usually located at specific endpoints. So you might see GQL, you might see uh, GraphQL, you might find what's called graphical. So that's graph, I, Q, L, pronounced graphical, um, GraphQL slash console, but any kind of request or response when you start seeing the word mutation, especially mutation is a great sign that you've got a GraphQL API. But that's a lot about kind of the, the, the stuff around it. Let's talk technical. How does GraphQL works? Okay. So GraphQL implements a graph structure as the database. There are queries and mutations. Queries fetch data. Mutations allow data to be edited. Fragments allow for easily saved lists of fields and meta fields allow for the introspection of query or mutation information. Don't worry if you don't get that, we are going to go into each one. So let's first talk about graph structure. Now, usually, especially if you've been in um, data and you've designed databases before, you often represent data as tables and of columns and rows, uh, like spreadsheets, right? But actually, when we start to look at um, APIs, and especially when we start to look at more complex web applications, we actually see linking together. So we start to um, kind of see those one-to-many, one-to-one, uh, many-to-many connections between different pieces of data. Now, we can think about it in the traditional flat way of like, okay, we're going to do uh, I get every book where the author is equal to this author and we can get the ID and we can do all of this stuff. But actually the natural form of this data is a graph, right? Like if you look at this graph over here and I show this to you, I'm just turning the laser pointer. You can see we've got books connected to authors, authors connected to authors via co-authors um, and we can have different books. And we can see from here, this author has two books. And this author has also published with this person here. And you can see how a graph tends to be this kind of natural form of how we might think about this linked data. So queries. Now queries in GraphQL are written to be flexible. They are very, very flexible. Um, and what happens on kind of the developer side is that you write the queries as a developer. But don't worry, I'm actually gonna show you this. Um, you can request any field easily, including related entities on the graph, and then uh, fields associated with that entity. So they're written as kind of like functions, um, the same way you might write like a PHP function, you can write GraphQL. Um, you can return a single result or several. You can also include arguments or kind of data manipulation. They're very structured. So let's see this in practice. So if I go to my vulnerable API, um, there we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna turn on is we can see I've got a GraphQL endpoint. So don't worry too much. I'll show you the actual process of hacking this. I'm just gonna show you um, how it works to query it. So if I just cancel that, you can see here I've got this weird console. So all you need to do to write a query is do query. And then you write the query you want. So if we go over here, we can actually see we've got documentation. So we can do, okay, I want to query users. So then we do little curly brackets again. So then you might be thinking, okay, what do you want to return from that? So we can do name. We can do uh, email. We can do whatever, whatever fields are in here we can do. Now, if we press go here, you can see we get the results. So that's how GraphQL queries look. They're very structured, um, but we can also then explore related uh, fields. So users will, might have something like uh, grades. So we can go in here and go grades and open this up. And now we can make a, a query link back to grades. So if I'm gonna do say grade here, and then let's get the comments. Um, we can now see that we can query um, of each user all of their grades, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so what we see here is this quite structured kind of formal way of doing things that actually is quite straightforward. It really just takes some time. Um, and this is all well and good when you have the documentation. But 
uh, you might not always have the documentation, especially if you're hacking. And you can see here, you can also have in this example, um, you can do a search. So get the human with the ID of 1000 and get their name and height. Um, you can see here, we can have comments and we can also have related fields that I showed you before. And you can also have other kind of functions like changing the unit. So that's queries. So what about mutations? Now mutation, especially the word mutation is very, very obviously GraphQL. Um, and especially if you ever see that in like a anything really, and you see oh mutation, you should instantly be thinking GraphQL because it's rarely used anywhere else. Um, so while queries fetch data, mutations edit it. So we can look at kind of assign variables, um, but we can also just do it normally. So if I go back to my little vulnerable API here, so these are my queries, I can go here and go to mutation like this. And then if we go back to the schema, go to mutation, we can see we've got update user password. So let's use that one. Update user password. So we need the ID of the user. Um, so let's do ID one. And then we need the new password. So let's go hello. Oh, I forgot to label them ID. And this one is password. Okay, there we go. Ah, so now we can return data back from it. So let's get the name. Let's get the password and let's get the ID. So this is our very basic mutation. So if we run that, you can see we can update the user password. Great. Awesome. We have like the ID, the name and the password. Great. So it's not as scary as it first seems. And we can do this. We can also do the same thing. We start to recall related content as well. So that is a very basic mutation. Let's talk about fragments and meta queries. Now, you don't necessarily have to know these, um, but it explains how GraphQL works under the hood. So fragments allow you to decide list of fields and request multiple queries using the same list. So you can kind of imagine, oh, yeah, I want to get used like I want every single user to come back with the name and the ID, um, but I only want those where the ID is less than five or where they're not an admin or whatever. So then you can do these kind of um, fragments. You can see here, you can run this fragment um, on this, this comparison here. Um, so it's used for comparisons. It's also used if you wanna just return a, a known list of fields. Now, meta fields allow you to inspect the API. So instead of looking and querying the API, we're re querying parts of um, what the API can do. And that's kind of confusing. And it's really important for something called introspection, which is unique to GraphQL. Um, but I'm going to leave that for the moment because I want to probably answer some of your questions. OK, but how? How are you supposed to know? what queries we have to have, what mutations we have, what arguments there are, what fields you can return. Katie, it's all well and good that you have this API that you have the actual documentation for because you wrote it this week. Um, you can't tell me that if I'm looking at a target, they're going to go, oh yeah, here's our GraphQL API. Um, have fun. So I'm glad you ask. Let's talk about those fragments and let's talk about those meta queries. So introspection. Introspection is unique to GraphQL. And you might kind of guess by the name, but introspection means to look at the um, GraphQL API itself um, and to know something about it. So aka how to find all those queries and mutations. Just let the API tell you what they are. Um, so why is it important to learn GraphQL syntax? GraphQL is not only challenging because of its syntax, not because it has really hard bugs. Now, the actual bugs in GraphQL are not different than any other bugs you find in any other API. If you look at the OWASP API top 10, it is exactly the same bugs, exactly the same vulnerabilities. I promise you there is nothing special about GraphQL bugs apart from the syntax. So it's really important to understand how queries and mutations are written and what concepts like meta queries and fragments are. Um, and that's why, because GraphQL is really easy to do recon on. And if you don't like me, don't really like doing recon, you don't have to do it. So let's talk about introspection. 
his introspection query. I'm sure you all understand this and I don't have to go over it more. Um, so introspection is a feature of GraphQL. So because you can have fragments and because you can have meta queries, GraphQL can tell us about its queries. Um, it makes recon a breeze, but we need to interpret the results. So how do we do that? Well, we take this big long thing here. So what this does is return um, things like the schema. And you can see here we have like schema, query name, name, mutation type, name, types, kind, name, description, fields, include depth, whatever. So what we do is we run this thing and then we put it in a tool called GraphQL Voyager. Now this can help us visualize the output of GraphQL. So let's do it. So actually if I just end the show because it'll be a bit easier. Okay, right. So this is our um, kind of vulnerable API, but we won't normally see graphical. Graphical is quite rare to be how to have on like the um, the like just exposed. Um, it tends to be more for kind of testing. Um, but this is the GraphQL kind of endpoint. So I said only has one endpoint, and it is usually um, GraphQL uh, query. So. I'm going to go here to payload all the things because nothing is ever unique. I'm going to take this entire URL encoded thing for us, and then I'm going to press go. And it's going to return a bunch of garbage. Now, I'm not a computer. I can't naturally read JSON, um, so I'm not going to. I'm going to take this, copy it, um, and I'm going to put it into GraphQL Voyager. So. I go over to here, change the schema, introspection. You can just put in the results of the introspection query in there. Press display and it shows you what it looks like. Like you don't have to do anything. It's just here. Um, right, so what can we see from this? Well, before we could see the um, like the, the documentation via the schema, via the, the, the tool but we don't have access to that at the moment. So what we can see is we've got queries. So the queries we have are users, grades, vulnerabilities, class, and roles. Maybe it's a little bit larger. So from there, we can see, okay, users, we have a lot of connections. And this is kind of the difficult part of inter is interpreting this. So we can go, okay, query users, right. So what else have we got here? Well, users, can get the user's role. We've got the grades, we've got the classes they're in and the classes they're teaching. So it looks really confusing like this, but actually all we, need, all we really care about is what's on this side here in the fields. And we can start to craft our queries like this. So we can go, okay, user exists. So we could go in here and we could change this and we could start to literally go in here and start writing a query that would would, would work um and we can scroll we can scroll down because we can also access grades and we can see here we've got access to the user and the uni class um so this is how you would see uh queries we can also see mutations and you can see here that actually you know, we have these two mutations, user mutation, up, update user password, and we can see kind of what types it needs, what we need to put in there. You know, we can see that ID is an integer, but name is a string. We can see that uh, we have connections, things like roles, and then we can start to query that and start to better understand the entire API. Um, and what does this really do for us? Well, this allows us to be informed as we test. So we're not just shot shooting blindly in the dark, we're actually understanding what we're actually looking at and crafting queries. Now, this is important because like I said, there is no unique vulnerabilities on GraphQL. Now, a lot of people will say that introspection is a vulnerability. It's not a vulnerability, it's a feature of the language. You will probably, if you try and report that, people will just say not applicable or informative at best. Now, being able to go into the introspection and actually understand it, that's where you start to get your vulnerabilities. Because if you know by looking at this, you know, okay, we can update user password exists. Is there any authentication on that? Can we update anybody's password? Um, you know, we've also got over here in our queries, we have something called vulnerability. Is that secure? Can we just get all the vulnerabilities of the API? That sounds pretty good. <laughs> 
so we're not necessarily like um, uh, limited in this way. Do I just put the slides back up? Um, I can kind of show you how this would work on, on this API as well. So we have this kind of big one, the Star Wars API. Um, I would like to change the pointer to be a laser pointer. Thank you. Um, we can see these connections. So root, we can query for films. And over here, we can see everything a film has. We can then look and see, oh, here's all the types they need. You know, we need, if we want to get the film, we need the ID and we need the film ID. Um, if we want to get all the people, we need the person ID. Um, we can then look and see these like more in depth look at this kind of API where we have um, the release date, which we know is a string, but we know it's formatted in ISO, right? So now we can start to build these queries and we can start to better understand the API. So you might also have, you know, mutations and, you know, I showed you a very, very small API, um, but these can have hundreds of mutations. They can have a lot of them and we need to test each one of these for vulnerabilities. So what next? Well, what next is that we now know all the endpoints. We can actually skip right to the API hacking. We know the endpoints because we know they're the queries and mutations. We can just find normal API bugs. It's not different. It's just a different um, uh, like visual, right? So I do want to say this again because I think it's quite important. I think people get confused. Introspection itself is not considered a vulnerability in most applications. Um, it's considered documentation. Now, what we'd want to do is we want to test all these queries just like we test a regular API. There is no difference. But sometimes introspection is disabled because people do see it as a security risk. They may not pay it out as a vulnerability, but they might see it internally as well. Um, we can still find uh, use recon to find API endpoints. We can click buttons. We can figure out the structure of queries. We can replace likely entity names or just test visible GraphQL endpoints. Keep an eye out for any documentation, like Shopify has extensive documentation. Errors. GraphQL will handily tell you what you messed up so you can go ahead and fix it. Thanks, GraphQL. That was really helpful. I didn't know how I was supposed to do that, but now you've told me. Okay, so tools. Now, there are some tools which are unique to GraphQL. So I just wanted to kind of go over some of them. Um, so first is GraphQL IDE. Um, so this makes it a little bit easier to interact with a GraphQL API by just being in, in a IDE. Fairly easy to use. You're still going to be writing your queries by hand when you get to the exploitation stage. Um, but it's a great way of kind of visualizing it as an alternative to graphical. Um, Altair, which is very similar, um, looks a lot like Postman. So if you've used Postman before, you're probably um, kind of familiar. It also is dark. So if you also don't like bright lights, you can, you can use that one as well. You're still going to be handwriting your queries. You're always going to be handwriting your queries. Unless you use some of these ones. So um, I'm going to show you how to use this when we get to the demonstration. But we have something called InQL, which is a burp add-on, which sends an introspection query to show the queries and mutations. It integrates with burp directly. So if you didn't know, book bounty hunters don't like using OWASP zap. We much prefer burp. I'm really sorry. I'm very, very sorry I'm going to be using uh, uh, burp. But it integrates quite, quite well. Um, and if you're already a power user of Burp and you already have a lot of tools via Burp, this can be a really great way of just getting it in there. Um, and it can also generate documentation. It's really cool. Uh, it will also run a graphical instance locally. Um, so you can actually still have access to graphical. Uh, so you can, you can use it like that. We also have GraphQL map. So if you're familiar with SQL map, um, you might know it can, um, do things like do SQL injection automatically and do a bunch of different ways of doing it. But GraphQL map is very similar, works in the command line. Um, it doesn't just do introspection though, it can also generate no SQL and SQL injection payloads as well. Um, GraphQL path enum, understand large graphs. Uh, what you may have noticed from all of this is that GraphQL can get very complex very, very quickly, especially when um, you have like loads of different entities and you have loads of different queries and you don't know how they're all related. Um, this is a really great tool which will show you how to get from node A to node B 
using um, queries. So it's really useful when you're testing something, you're going to go, oh, I have access to users. How do I get to, I don't know, grades from that? Um, and it kind of walks through it to show it. So you can kind of see it here. So it will go the query assignable teams to team audit log items to audit log items to user, etc. So it's quite nice. Okay. So GraphQL bugs in the wild. What bugs should you be looking for? Uh, they are the same as API bugs. I keep saying this, uh, but I think it's really important to say that the API bugs you find in GraphQL are the same as you find in regular APIs. You get the usual suspects, information disclosure, IDOs, um, bypassing client restrictions. The only thing that makes it special is the syntax. And that is the only thing that you know you should be worried about, okay? Um, so let's, I will show you some examples. So this was an undocumented API, a GraphQL API endpoint, uh, just allowed you to change a store's customer email. It was one um, like mutation on the GraphQL endpoint, uh, didn't have proper authentication on it, very simple, got paid out uh, $1,500 for it. Like these are not really complex bugs. Um, this is an interesting one. This is an information disclosure which shows the internal beer consumption at Spotify, at Shopify. Sorry, so they basically um, enumerated the GraphQL um, API. They use introspection. Realize it has references to beer. Um, so then they started to send these crafted queries to find out what they could discover. And they realized this is the internal like ale tap, which apparently also uses GraphQL to see how full all of the barrels are. Um, so and then they said, you know, this should really be internal, I guess. <laughs> um, and that got paid out like $800. I think it was more for fun more than actual information disclosure. But, you know, that's really simple. It was just query the API. There was nothing special about it. Um, and here's a more serious example of the same thing. By querying the GraphQL API um, directly, it was possible for a user to have some information about internal activity on HackerOne reports. That's it. That's the whole vulnerability. It is using um, the GraphQL uh, a API to send a crafted query, and that's it. That's the whole bug. It is one, like you can see here, it is one request. These are not really complex bugs. And are there GraphQL specific bugs? Yes, there are. Um, and that's mainly because of the way GraphQL is built. There are some unique ones and it primarily revolves around how the queries have been written in the code and implemented. Uh, but these usually require access to the source code and like skills and source code review. So I'm not really gonna go over them too much, but there are bugs that can appear just in GraphQL. But I don't really make videos for people who already know what they're doing. Um, my videos are introductory videos. So we start at the basics and the basics are they're exactly the same. There is nothing special about GraphQL APIs. Let's hack some stuff. So how do we actually hack a GraphQL API? How do we actually do this from start to finish? So your general approach when approaching a GraphQL API should be first to intro use introspection to find the queries and mutations. Now, if you can't find them uh, or it doesn't work, don't worry, just press all the buttons instead. That is my traditional recon approach. If anybody asks me how I do recon, I just press all the buttons. Like literally, if you're on an app, for example, you go into the hamburger menu, you change like every random thing you can find, just collect API endpoints as much as you can. And what you then wanna do is identify the business logic revolving around those queries. Um, and you can craft, then craft your queries to check for what well, I think are the two biggest but easiest to find issues, which is first information disclosure and secondly IDOs, so insecure direct object reference, or um, they are also called uh, BOLAs, so broken object level authorization. Um, and you can also find broken function level authorization. We call them IDOs in the bug bounty community. Now, remember, and I keep on saying this because I think it's really important, the hard part of GraphQL is the syntax. Once you get over the syntax, you can really show um, or kind of understand how it works. But, you know, don't, don't, don't just tell me this. That's really boring to listen to. Uh, let's do it together. So I showed you this kind of um, setup before. 
what I'm going to do is now show you it in Burp itself. So I've got Burp open here, and you can kind of see. Um, and I'm using the free version. You don't need to pay for Burp when you first get started. I'm going to go into the proxy. And I'm going to turn Incept off because Incept is annoying. So I've opened up um, our little port swigger thing here. And what I'm going to do is just copy this and put it into there. And we should be able to now see in Burp, um, we can see the GraphQL endpoint. Great. So we can use InQL. So it has a scanner here. And it can automatically um, find all of the mutations and all of the queries like this. And as you can see, I didn't even press any buttons. It just did it automatically. Now, the cool thing is if I open this thing, you can open. Go in here. Ah. Open in browser. Okay. Wrong screen. Right. So you can see in here, um, it actually has generated some documentation for us, just like um, GraphQL Voyager. But I'm going to show you using GraphQL Voyager. So initially, what we see here is we can see all of the little endpoints here have been disclosed. And we can see if we click on um, grades here, we can see we've got like some information about the grades. We can see we've got like all of the variables associated with it and all the columns. And then you can see we've act able to access users and then roles and then classes. Um, so what we can do here is we can go send to repeater and we can, there we go. Now we can see and change this. So the first thing we want to do is we might want to see, okay, grades. We've got comments created at, updated at, grade ID. So the first thing you might want to do there is that's obviously doing some kind of filtering. Let's remove that. So oh, what is actually in here? So we can see, we can see our grades here. So you can see this first one is a grade of 33 for user nothing. So let's find out what the user is. We can go in here and we can send that. And now we can see the name of the person. So we can see the user with the name hello has gotten quite a few of these grades. But then when we scroll down, we can see, oh, we're starting to get real data here. So we can scroll down here and we can do this backwards as well. So we've got some kind of class is null. So we might want to do instead of description, use name. I think it's called uni class. Uni class, maybe it is just class. So we can see something's up with class, but I mean, do we really need to tell if we can see other people's grades regardless uh, and we can get their name? We probably got a vulnerability here, but we can do more than that because you can see roles here. What we might want to do is just see what all the roles are. So we'll go here, we'll remove grades and change that um, to roles. And then we'll open it up and let's try and see if we can see any interesting roles. We might only have the ID in there as well. So we can see here, we can see admin, student, teacher. So that's useful. How do we know which users are in each of those? Well, you can just access it via the API. We can go into user here and then we can ask for their name, their email. We can try password as well see if that works. So we can see here, um, we can't see the users associated with it. So what we might want to then do is go and see why that's the case. So looking in here, going into um, what the other queries are and seeing well, we don't really have, we have a users query and they seem to have some kind of access to roll this way. So we can go backwards as well. Um, but that's probably not the most interesting one because we've got an update user password and an update user. So let's assume we're doing an attack. Um, let's have a look at all the users and try and find which ones have a um, have a uh, role ID of admin. So if we go here, we probably want the, the let's take all of that stuff. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of created app. We don't want role created app. We would like the name potentially. 
we'll go in here, go here, go here, send it. And you can see here, okay, roll student. Um, if we scroll here though, we can see the admin user is Dolores Green that has the email cgrady at hotmail.com. Now, why is this kind of useful for us? Well, I don't know if you saw, but one of the mutations is update user password. So if we go here and we go, you know, send to repeater, um, and we kind of make it look nice again, um, we can see, you know, we need the path, new password and then the ID. Well, the ID of this user is six. So we'll put in six for the ID and we'll change, we'll keep the password as code. Um, so we're updating the user uh, with ID six with the password code. So we'll press send and it says success. Great. Now if we go here, we go to a vulnerable API here. We go back to the whole application, log in, that email address, code, log in. And as you can see, we've logged into the admin user. Um, and that is how easy it is to get started with GraphQL. Like again, not a very complex vulnerability, simple because this API endpoint didn't have any authorization on it. Um, very straightforward. There's nothing special we did. We literally just changed an ID to six. It was understanding which is the hard part and that syntax. So with that, that is the end of my presentation this evening on GraphQL hacking. I hope you found it useful, interesting, entertaining. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening to me waffle about APIs. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Katie, for an amazing live demo and uh, your talk. Um, I'm checking for questions. Uh, there are a couple of them uh, coming up on the Slido and on YouTube. Uh, question number one, uh, someone is asking, what is payload all the things and where is it? So payload all the things is a great um, Git repository, which has a bunch of payloads for security people. So you can see here, we've got like a bunch of GraphQL and how to do like uh, down here, we have no SQL injection and SQL injection, but it has more than just GraphQL. It has a bunch of these different ones. We have everything from file inclusion, directory traversal, JSON web token stuff, um, cross-site scripting, all of that. Like I'll put it in the chat in, in here so people can have a look. But it's a fantastic repository. It is so useful. Excellent. Thanks very much, Katie. And there's another question. Um, what if introspection is off and I can't find any mutations? Is it still possible to find any vulnerabilities? Yeah, so people don't make GraphQL endpoints just to have them sit around. They will be somewhere in the web application or the mobile application. You just need to sit there and search for it. Yes, it sucks. Yes, it's very time consuming. Um, but if you just poke around, you can find quite a lot. And I would say for the majority of API bugs that you can find quite a lot of them by just pressing every button, especially if you're like me and don't really like the kind of recon side of it, you can just sit there and, you know, press buttons, change your, uh, change your, uh, say, username, change your password, change your email address. Those might be three different mutations. Maybe it's one mutation. It's just change user. Then you can see, oh, you know, I can see um, whatever. Uh, I can see, oh, not only in this mutation can I change my email address, but I can also change my password. Is that actually secure? Has that actually got um, authorization on it? There's a methodology there and it's not just chaos, but it is very close to chaos. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, we have another question coming up on YouTube. Um, are there any GraphQL extensions for OWASP Zap? Um, I have no idea because I don't use OWASP Zap, but there is no reason why you can't um, like use just a, a graphical in the browser. Um, you can actually host graphical local locally because that's what this thing does uh, where is the thing there is a thing you can see it uh, this can actually load up graphical automatically there we go so in ql can 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 load graphql um graphically on uh, even a, a remote uh 
GraphQL API. So you can actually set up Graphical to have it as your like little tool. You don't really need complex tools. You really don't. It is very much a case of write a query, URL encode it, send it, see what happens. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, there's another question coming up. Uh, Katie, while hacking GraphQL, what was the most difficult hack? I won't answer that question. I'll tell a better story instead. Um, sounds a bit weird, but I promise. So when I was actually hacking GraphQL at the time, um, I had gone into a hotel room with my mentors and this was at uh, Vegas. So I had like a formal mentorship program. So I went in, I went and I, I went into the hotel room. We started hacking and in five minutes, I found a vulnerability in the GraphQL API. Um, and I didn't find it by doing introspection or anything like that. I found it by just pressing the buttons and um, changing like values. So I think I changed, um, oh, I, I, I um, saw what the endpoint was then kind of calling and you had to do something beforehand, but I was basically able to skip a bunch of steps. Uh, and redeem all of my points that I then collected for money. And I found that in five minutes. Um, I then spent the rest of the day trying to find more vulnerabilities in this API, found a few others, but then never quite got to level exploiting it. So I um, did a introspection query because five minutes, I didn't quite know what I was doing. By the time I got to kind of later on in the day, I knew what introspection was. Did that, pasted it in, it was maybe 10 minutes till the end, very much cutting it close and this massive API popped up and I was like, oh, I do not have time to look at all of these endpoints. Oh, <laughs> um, and then from that, I was like, okay, well, I, and then got some uh, pretty uh, okay vulnerability. I think it wasn't great, but it was fine. Um, but they paid out money. So yeah, that was very stressful though. Once again, leaving it till the very end of the, um, of uh, of uh, the uh, event to find my bugs. Excellent, thank you, Katie. I think there's a question about what's the name of your YouTube channel. I believe it's inside the PhD. Is that right? Yes, I'm also in the chat as well. Um, I'm like I've got like a purple avatar, but yeah, inside the PhD is my YouTube channel. I'm very proud to say you can now Google me, which is one of my best achievements in my life. Um, yes. I, I, there's not much hap else happening in my life, uh, but being able to be Googled, yeah, if you Google me, you'll also find my YouTube channel as well. That, oh, and it's also inside a PhD. PhD is in the, the academic qualification, insider as an insider threat, not inside a PhD, um, and not uh, PHP, the programming language, though I do mainly use that, and that's what this demo was built in. Oh, yes. And of course, congratulations on completing your PhD thesis. Uh, it's all about using machine language, uh, oh, so the machine learning. Yes, there it is. Uh, for uh, my thesis, the threats, it right? So this is. Um, yeah, all about. Yeah, my background is um, uh, NLP. So this is all about how you can look at loads of reports and understand an instant. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty so sure a lot of people in. who have to analyze lots of uh, text and chats and uh, figure out if there's any inside the threat, you know, their organizations are going to really uh, be appreciating your PhD thesis. Right, let me check if there are any more questions. Are there any questions from our other speakers or co-presenters? Let me just check. I am not seeing any new questions. So there's one uh, which is probably a very generic one. I'm pretty sure people get, um, people probably ask you this uh, quite frequently. Someone is asking, do I need to know both network and web concepts to become a good security analyst? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I personally think it's good to understand how the internet works because what you'll find, and this is my experience, is that you'll learn about how the internet works and you'll go, this shouldn't be possible. The internet might be cursed because the way the internet works is actually kind of mind blowing that we have so many things that actually work for the internet. Like how on earth does YouTube work when you start looking at like networking protocols? It's incredible. So I would say do that to just appreciate more how the internet works. Um, but I really don't think you need to be an expert in web application security. I think what makes a good security analyst is a mixture of not just being like the amazing extra smart huge brain 
security person, but communication skills is one of the most vital skills in security because you are always going to spend your entire career telling people that something they're looking at is, is a security risk and being able to speak to them in their own language is a really big help in that. Excellent. Thanks, Katie. I believe, um, uh, Olivia, do you have a question for Katie? Uh, no, I just want to uh, add on. Um, I, I'm like over here just kind of silently clapping with the part about uh, communication being so important. And that's it's it's exactly why I want to make sure that beginners have that, because it's one thing to, mm -hmm. to read something and think you understand it. But then especially when you think about how to communicate with people of in different audiences, it, you have to know how to be able to switch things up and go more or less technical depending. So I, I completely agree. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Uh, thanks. And I think uh, uh, my colleague Sharif has a question for you. Sharif, go ahead. Hey, Katie. How are you? Hey. Uh, I'm good. So, <laughs> it's good to see you again. So um, my, my question was with regards to the OS Foundation. So um, this was a really amazing demo. Uh, would you like to have a small article and put that video on one of the OWASP uh, blog posts? Um, oh, yeah, so for folks sure. can see quickly on the OWASP one. Great. And the, to be cheeky, second question is, so what can we do with Zaps that you guys would like it? Oh, OK. I, I'm glad you asked. Bam, because I brought some homework with me. Um, so this is the code that powers it. So what makes something vulnerable to some of these vulnerabilities and what makes them not vulnerable? Let me show you. So if we go into vulnerability query, you'll see there's this one line here that says, if the user isn't logged in, don't let them access it. So my top advice would be maybe put an if statement in when you're authorizing things, um, because one line will save you like, like tons of vulnerabilities. It's amazing how many vulnerabilities are literally caused by an if statement being missing. Um, and in this case as well, this uh, demo we've got on Laravel, Laravel has middleware and you can put middleware into your um, code. So that way you only have to write like one if statement and then you just tell it what middleware to use. Excellent. This, this one line here, this is what I'd recommend. And I'm being kind of uh, facetious here, but actually quite a lot of security vulnerabilities are caused by very simple, like just mistakes in code. And it happens. Applications are huge. They're big. They are very complex and stuff like this just gets missed. So having good code review practices, making sure that developers are peer reviewing themselves, um, having an open security culture where people can say, hey, I think there's a mistake. I think there's a security vulnerability here that isn't going to then have this kind of knock on effect of like shaming developers for not being good enough or creating kind of negative aspects in the, in the security culture. And I think also having like security culture in general, you know, if you can support it, having a bug bounty program, potentially, if you can't support it, maybe looking at just having a security dot text where people can access a security contact if they need to engaging with the wider security uh, community and just being open to some of these ideas. Uh, cool, thank you, Katie. I was asking about OWASP Zap though, like what things can we change in OWASP Zap that- Oh, sorry. To prefer over burp, like how do we get it to a point where bug bounty hunters like it almost as much as burp? My biggest concern with it is um, uh, the, UI. The UI is much worse. Burp's UI isn't great, but OWASP Zap is much more confusing. Just needs to be simplified. If the UI was better, I think more people would use it because it has more tools that Burp doesn't have or that Burp users have to pay for. Um, and I think it's going to be really hard to get us off of the port swigger in general. People like me, and I'm calling myself out, this is a self-roast, need to be promoting um, open source software instead of promoting paid software, especially when a lot of people who want to get into bug bounty can't necessarily afford software, which is over 300 pounds. And yeah, people need to realize it's an option. And I'd like it if the UI was much simpler as well. No, no, perfect. And that's really nice feedback. We need to know these things so we figure out how we can improve it and get more people to, to, to like it and use it. So much appreciated. Thanks. 
Yeah, just to add, not many people know, but I believe uh, both Burp and Zap started as forks of another tool called Paros Proxy many, many years ago. <laughs> I didn't know that, actually. That's interesting. 